Sir, I think I can start our session. Welcome everyone to our conference. And yeah, we in the we are in the application development with the serverless and the containerization track. So yeah, we are here for the next session, which is OKD4, the OpenShift Kubernetes on the Fedora Core OS. And we have Christian Glombeck who would be presenting out this lightning talk. So we can start it over or uh, like we do we want to wait for a couple of minutes for the other participants to join let us know well hello everybody um welcome to devconf us and welcome to the okd4 openshift kubernetes on the fedora core os uh, session today i'm happy to have with me christian Gamba and antonio Ridaka to help um, fill out the the details on this topic and we're really glad you came um, we're really proud of this latest release of OKD, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we're going to talk about today. So the next slide. So on today's agenda, first, um, what we're going to cover off um, is uh, what, what is OKD. Then we're going to jump into an overview of operators and the operator framework, and we're going to dive a little deeper into one of the operators that's very important to OKD, the machine config operator. And then we're going to take you a little further down the stack to Fedora Core OS, and um, we may have a demo or two slid in there, and we'll leave some time at the end for questions. Um, that we know that's probably going to be through the chat or Slack or whatever facility that they give us um, for DevConf US. So um, look for Christian, Antonio, and myself um, in the chat afterwards. So um, without further ado, next slide. So what is OKD? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, it from a historical point of view. Um, first, um, you probably remember OKD being called Origin back in the day when it was a Ruby on Rails, MongoDB platform as a service offering. Um, and then about four or maybe five years ago now, we shifted and rebased on Kubernetes. Um, and um, OpenShift went through uh, a significant evolution um, going from OpenShift 3 to 4 as well, um, rebasing, leveraging um, operators. So you'll hear us talk a lot more about that as well. Um, so we basically take the OpenShift or OCP or OpenShift um, container platform code base and combine it with Fedora Core OS. And that's a, an interesting distinction, um, giving us a pure open source play um, for, from all the way down. So from the code base is all open source for OpenShift naturally, but there are some things um, about OpenShift, the product, um, some of the images and things that are based on RHEL core OS. So we um, at Red Hat are committed to having a pure open source offering of each of our products. So we um, have collaborated with the Fedora community and Fedora core OS and come out with a distribution, which we're called, we, You'll hear us talk about a lot as OKD4, um, and it allows us to um, distribute everything um, as open source. So we're remaining true to our sort of commitment. Now, this shift um, really went from being a platform as a service um, built on Kubernetes to something more of a self-contained ecosystem. Go to the next slide. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, so some of this, it's a really important distinction um, for us um, that we want to de deliver um, something that everybody can use um, freely and as open source, but also has all the functionality that comes with OCP um, just running on Fedora Core OS. And so a bit of a, an example here is um, the difference between OCP and OKD is OKD delivers um, releases in a much faster um, cadence. Fedora Core OS um, comes out in a faster cadence than um, RHEL Core OS. So you get to try out all the new features um, and sometimes the bugs um, a little sooner than everybody else. And um, if you're really brave, um, you can even build and update your clusters from our nightly stream. So um, you, that's that can be a lot of fun. Um, and really, it's basically uh, a new, highly opinionated, um, as we are sometimes at Red Hat, 
um, but highly flexible Kubernetes-based ecosystem, and it's built around this new concept of operators, and we'll, we'll get more to that there. So through the operator framework, um, OKD manages your entire platform, um, automating the installation, automated patching, automated updates and maintenance of the entire environment, and very significantly, even the operating system itself, the updates for those. So um, this is this is kind of key, and we'll go into more detail about Fedora 4 OS in, in a bit. But the full life cycle um, is managed by OKD through a specific set of operators, um, and it's deployable on many, many different infrastructures. If we hit the button one more time. There you go, pops in. Um, it's, it's deployable on many, many different infrastructures um, and platforms from bare metal to cloud. Um, and there's just a small sampling in the little icons here. You can do um, small edge clusters. You can build out massive compute workloads with OKD. Uh, you can deploy a single node if you're willing to forego high availability. Um, you can deploy high availability three node cluster where your worker nodes and your uh, control planes are sharing roles, or you can deploy a full enterprise grade cluster with a dedicated uh, control plane infrastructure and worker nodes. And if you want to know about these specifically, you can go look at the installer project, which you can find in GitHub under GitHub OpenShift slash installer, um, where you'll see a list of all the available deployment platforms and configurations. Um, at the end of all of this talk, there'll be a slide with more links and more resources, so don't panic. Um, and that's really at a very high level um, what we're doing um, with OKD. I don't know, Christian, if you want to add any more into that? Um, I think we'll go in, in depth more in a bit. All right, well then, um, I think we're handing it over to Antonio now. Yes. So, <clears throat> I'll, you know, the next point on your agenda is talking about the operators. And as Diane mentioned, OpenShift had a huge uh, shift from 3.11 to 4, where in 4, uh, we introduced the concept of the operators at the cluster level itself. Uh, and so before diving into the actual OpenShift 4 architecture, uh, and later in the MCO, we need to talk about what is an operator, what does it do, and the, the operator pattern as well. So next slide, I'll do it myself. Uh, so operators are, are a way for packaging, deploying, and managing cube application, right? So to put that into a real world example, uh, think about a MySQL uh, database. Uh, and we can think about the MySQL operator as, as something that is responsible for packaging, uh, installing, managing uh, the MySQL database itself on a cluster. You know, that's the, the key difference. Uh, and we can think about the possible uh, management things that this operator can do as, you know, rescheduling if a node fails or automatic data replication always is the, in, in the case that the node fails. So all, all this kind of stuff that we usually do manually, the operator can, you know, cover, cover for the human and can do all of this automatically with, you know, it's some tweaks and some configuration is still needed on the administration side, but you know, operators can do all of this and they're pretty powerful. And we'll see why, uh, while we dive more into how OpenShift is actually architectured with operators. Um, so this is actually uh, all we can say about the operators. There is, I talked about configuring the operators. That part is handled specifically by, um, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, um, by a custom resource definition. Those are just, you can think about them as just configuration files. But in this word, those are effectively Kubernetes object uh, stored in a CD. So, uh, so the so OpenShift 4 has been has been built um, leveraging operators, and we can see that they can not only manage uh, applications like MySQL, but they can also manage uh, things that are key to the cluster itself. Uh, 
So what we did uh, in Obershoot 4 is, you know, introducing the operator patterns for uh, the components that make a cluster, uh, make a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and so it's like uh, the, the the analogy would be having the cluster on autopilot because many of the, the things that, you know, an administrator would usually configure, like scaling up a node is like takes, you know, all, all the manual steps uh, to bring up the node and configure it, that will be done automatically by an operator. And we'll look about that specific operator uh, in the next few slides. Uh, in these slides, uh, we're gonna have a look at, you know, the, the key components uh, in form of operators that make uh, OpenShift 4. And, you know, we have one of the very first uh, operator, which is the the main one that is responsible for uh, the overall uh, health of the cluster is the cluster version operator. Uh, and since Overshoot 4 basically has uh, operators for anything that really makes the cluster, like you can see just below the cluster version operator, there is the Cube API server, uh, the Cube controller manager, the scheduler, etcd, those are all operators. Uh, and what the cluster version operator does is making sure that those components, uh, which are still uh, operators within the cluster, are at the right version. And you know, this is uh, this really opens up the door for for things like automatic cluster upgrades. Uh, you would just hit a button uh, and sync to the new version of the, you know, whatever latest OpenShift or OKD release uh, you have. Uh, there are you know, many other operators uh, which are core to the platform, like the network one, as you can see, just make sure that the CNI plugins and uh, are there and the DSDN is installed. There is the image registry. Anybody coming from 3.11 knows about this. Uh, in OpenShift 4, we now have uh, an operator that, that takes care of all of this. And it takes care of the image registry from you know, the real beginning, it, it set up the registry, the route, uh, an initial storage and things like that. So you can see, you know, all the manual uh, steps that we used to do before are now handled by the operator itself. Um, other examples of the operators that we have um, in the fourth release are, you know, the monitoring one, which as the name suggests, is responsible for collecting the metrics, display them on the console or anything, any aggregator that you can also install. Uh, the ingress operator, which ensures the, the router is set up. The storage one, uh, make sure that the C CSI plugins are installed and the storage classes exist. So all these, you know, operators are the, the core of the platform. Um, and as I said before, what we did in OpenShift 4 was leveraging the operator pattern uh, and, move, and use that at the core uh, of the cluster. So it's the it's uh, it's something like the cluster uh, manages itself because all these components in the forms of operators can just handle their own life cycle uh, in an ordered way. And you know you'll always have the latest version, and it's automatically synced. So there are there, the the concept itself is really powerful and. Uh, and OpenShift 4 is, is making a great job at, you know, leveraging it. Um, then we have this this other thing, which is still operator uh, related, which is the operator hub. So the components that I've talked before, the operators that I've talked before are core to the, to the cluster itself. You know, those manage the cluster life cycle, but, you know, at some point there will be somebody using the cluster. So uh, OpenShift has the, th this concept of the operator hub, uh, which is a community sourced in the index of uh, optional operators. Like you, you can see some of them like Grafana or Argo CD. So if you want to install them, the operator hub is integrated with the OpenShift console. So, you know, any admin can just go there and install uh, their additional operator. Those are usually application uh, focused. Uh, as I said before, these are really application focused, whether the one I talked about before are core to the platform. Uh, and guess what? There is an operator uh, 
which is like we call that manager uh, that takes care of the life cycle of those additional operators so you can do things like taking care of the operator scope whether it's cluster wide or namespace only uh, again it, should, it ensures that it can be updated manually manages permission you know and so on and so forth you can think about almost anything uh, life cycle related for for an application like Argo or Grafana. And so all, all of this brings us to uh, to the MCO, uh, which is it's one of the core components uh, that OpenShift 4 uses. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's related to, to the nodes that you have on a cluster. Uh, I mentioned it earlier that you know, in the early days or or before OpenShift 4, in order to bring up, to onboard a new node, you would need, you know, many manual steps, uh, you know, in order to bring up the actual instance, then configure it, then, you know, get up and running the kubelet, join the, the fleet, stuff like that. So that, all, all that isn't necessary anymore, thanks to uh, the operator pattern and specifically, uh, thanks to the machine config operator uh, or MCO for short. The machine config operator is again a, a core operator. That means it's managed by the cluster version operator, uh, which I mentioned it earlier. So, so the cluster version ensures that the machine config operator is always at the latest version uh, and it's and it's healthy as well. The machine the MCO, I'm gonna I'm gonna just say MCO from now on, hopefully. Uh, it's the operator that manages uh, the machine configuration. Uh, it does it does just these two things. It, it manages the machine configuration and it applies uh, DOS updates on the nodes. In our case, since we're using since we're on OKD, we're we're gonna apply these OS updates with RPM OS3. Uh, so the MCO really does just these two things. Say you want to configure, uh, I don't know, the a time zone setting on all the fleet of the nodes that you have in your cluster, you would use the MCO to actually ship the config to the, you know, to the nodes in your cluster. Uh, and again, the other super important thing that the MCO does is making sure that your host is always uh, updated. Uh, the way the MCO works is it's it's really easy if you're coming from from a you know from the Kubernetes world is we are leveraging custom resources and we are you know living by the, the concept of current versus desired or spec versus status. Uh, and so what the MCO does is basically uh, you know computing a diff between what it has and what the admin want, and after it compute the diffs, it just it just applies it, and so it you know it continuously reconciles itself to the latest uh, you know status and, and spec that the administrator want. Uh, it's like it's a finite state machine. Uh, at the end of the day, it's just there is a continuous loop like any Kubernetes controller, uh, and it just you know watches for any changes. In, in our case, again, those would be customizations or uh, OS updates coming from, uh, you know, from the from where the the actual uh, OS update is coming from. Um, so this is this is the, the machine config in a nutshell, uh, and hopefully that clarifies what, what it does. Uh, the machine config operator leverage mainly one. Custom resource definition. There are there are many, but the most important one, uh, it's the one in this slide. You can see it's a you know it's a super common uh, Kubernetes object. It has the the type and the object and just a spec uh, where an administrator can just go and and tweak all the fields. Uh, the most important thing about this uh, this custom resource is probably the config field. Uh, and I'm gonna explain the others as well. The configuration field, config field, which you can see it's just a runtime row extension. Nowadays, uh, it just contains the ignition config as we're 
leveraging ignition to to bring up new machines and install the cluster so the mco still leverages the ignition config to be able to you know customize the node in a way which is familiar to most cluster administrators as well uh, with ignition you can of course do the usual things that you would do even manually like creating a system the unit a timer uh, you know disabling a service all these things you know, change a configuration, change the crony conf. You can do all of this with, with Ignition. And so the, the config field is probably the most important one uh, in the machine config CR uh, as that allows administrator full control over the over the node. Uh, and then the other things that you would find on a machine config is the US image URL. That's the that's another important thing, as that's the second point from the previous slide where the MCO does configuration and OS updates. So OS image URL is nothing more than a uh, than a pullable container image which contains the actual diff of the OS update. But I, I think Kristen is going to talk more about that later on. Uh, and then the rest of the fields that you can see all relates to the customization side of, of of the MCO. So there are, to some extent they're still related to the config, uh, but we actually we split that out those out so that they're more um, I'd say we, we can control more uh, we could control them more. And and I guess I'll finish with the uh, the component of the MCO. It's a subcomponent of the MCO itself which is the one responsible uh, to, you know, to, to change the status from, from current to desired, right? So uh, say you want to ship a new file uh, on every host in the fleet, masters and workers, uh, you would create a machine config, uh, you know, do all the, the things that you would do with that machine config, create it, uh, so the cluster has it, and once the MCO notice, uh, it will go and create its vision of, of of the host, and then there is this component that actually takes care of applying that diff, and this is the machine config daemon. So the machine config daemon is is just a daemon set uh, that runs on every node in the cluster, uh, and again, what it does is just watching for changes in uh, that the administrator requested and just apply them. Uh, and as I said before, the machine config daemon understand the config field of the machine config. So anything you would, almost anything, uh, since there's, it's just a subset. So uh, it really understand uh, a, subset, a subset of the ignition configuration, like I said before, like folders, uh, system D, and perhaps, some some other uh, and it, again what it does is just apply uh, this new uh, view of the system uh, on the node itself and just continuously reconcile and again in, in the Fedora core OS case uh, This container image, which we call machine OS content, uh, and then use RPM OS3 to actually update the system and trigger a reboot. And with that, I guess Christian can take over. Thanks, Antonio. Um, so yeah, next uh, we'll dive deeper into Fedora Core OS. What is Fedora Core OS? Next slide, please. So Fedora Core OS in one sentence. Fedora Core OS is an automatically updating, minimal, monolithic, container-focused operating system designed for clusters, but also operable standalone, optimized for Kubernetes, but also great without it. So let's dig in a little bit. Um, next slide, please. Uh, let's try it in sh two sh shorter sentences. Fedora Core OS is an auto-updating container role and you can run it with Kubernetes or without it. Next slide, please. 
So there's a lot to unpack here. And we've come to Fedora Coro as what it is now um, through yeah, a few streams uh, yeah, have, have flown together here. So um, it was uh, two communities, um, the Container Linux community and the Project Atomic community um, that uh, you may know for, for delivering um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, Atomic Host, CoreOS, uh, no, Fedora Atomic Host, and um, CentOS Atomic Host in the past. And this, these two communities have merged and um, we've kind of taken the best of, of two worlds here. Um, so uh, yeah, most importantly, the container Linux philosophy um, of how they, they really pioneered um, the container focused operating system and um, their provisioning stack and the cloud native um, ex expertise um, here uh, and from Atomic Host, uh, we have the very solid uh, Fedora package foundation, which we build on. Um, we have the update stack, um, and obviously we run SE Linux enabled. Yeah, next slide, please. Let's have a look at the features. Um, the OS versioning and security uh, is a major part of uh, of the the goal of Fedora Core OS, providing a secure platform for containerized workloads. So Fedora Core OS uses RPM OS tree uh, to create images. To, they're composed out of RPMs. Um, and OS tree is like a Git repository for your operating system. So you may know RPM OS tree or OS tree um, generally, in general, from uh, a few other projects. Uh, for example, Flatpak uses it. And it's really just, um, yeah, it, it really just commits a file system to a repository and writes a hash. So it's very easy to uh, uh, to follow back through the stack and see what came from where. And if we compose a new image, we have a very clear delta of all the files within the file system um, that have changed from one commit to the next, which also allows for functionality like um, rolling back uh, a commit or uh, rebasing to a totally different um, post operating system. Um, in the case of OKD, we use um, the machine OS content container, which Antonio mentioned, to deliver an OS tree commit um, and which is en encapsulated in a container, unpack that write it to disk and reboot. Mm. So yeah, uh, you'll get a single identifier for each version of the entire operating system, which ma makes it very monolithic and very secure. Um, and a very important feature is most of the file system is mounted read only. So you can only write files uh, in specific places uh, that are enabled for it. But that, um, General protection on most look, uh, on most directories in the file system prevents accidental OS corruption um, and also other kinds of attacks. Additionally, uh, SE Linux, as I mentioned, is enforcing by default uh, to prevent uh, compromised apps from breaking out of the, the sandbox. Next slide, please. All right, automated provisioning. Automated provisioning um, is a big feature. So Fedora Core OS uses Ignition to automate provisioning. You've already heard a little bit about Ignition before because the machine config operator and the machine config resource actually encapsulate and manage Ignition configuration. So within an Ignition configuration, you can uh, encode any logic for machine lifetime, um, really anything. Um, the machine config operator only supports a subset. I think Antonio mentioned that as well, which is files and systemd units. Um, but within the ignition specification, the config specification, there is actually space or that there are actually much more features in there, which ignition takes the binary and applies at the very first boot of the machine. So you can reformat your uh, your drives, repartition. Um, 
and uh, really do a lot of things there. That happens uh, at the very first time the machine is provisioned. The machine config operator then takes over that config and enforces changes on a subset of, of that config. Um, so for us, uh, if you have a pure Fedora core OS system, you can provision it with Ignition. You can really do anything. We automate that with the OpenShift installer for OKD and then um, manage it with the machine config operator. And very importantly, it is the same config on any platform. So it's really idempotent and supposed to give you no headache whatsoever when doing the configuration because Fedora Core OS, the machine, once it, once it runs, uh, notices where it runs and applies uh, defaults for that platform. So we have just one release artifact, that, or a few release artifacts, but um, fewer than, we have, than there are clouds because we don't need a release artifact for each cloud. Fedora Core OS is very smart about this in, yeah, in using Ignition. Uh, that makes it very easy. Okay, next slide, please. So let's have a look at the Ignition configuration in detail. Um, Ignition is a declarative JSON format. It, Ignition runs only once, as I just mentioned, at the very beginning uh, of your provisioning, once, it, once the first boot happens. And Ignition actually doesn't run on the, on the uh, root file system you later have. It runs within the init RAM file system. So it sets up the new file system within the, uh, within the RAM and then writes it to disk and reboots again into that file system that you just configured the way that you wanted to with that machine config, with that ignition configuration. Yeah, it can write files, systemd units, create users and groups, partition disks, create RAID arrays, format file systems. Um, there's really no limits with configuring your machine with Ignition uh, configuration, which is also why we've chosen Ignition as our on-disk date representation for the nodes on the cluster, which are then managed by the MCO. To make uh, writing Ignition configuration a little bit more human-friendly, we've created this tool called FCCT, the Fedora Core OS config transpiler, which lets you write ignition or FCCT configuration in a human-friendly YAML format, and it has some shorthands for generating um, ignition that does a little bit more complex tasks, like generating the systemd units um, for those tasks. You can have a look at the spec um, it's very similar, and you can transpile a, a Fedora Core OS config to Ignition configuration. Um, yeah, next slide, please. These, these are the features in use in OpenShift OKD. We have automated provisioning. OpenShift install generates Ignition configs, and when each node is started, that Ignition config is applied. Subsequent processes join the node on the cluster to the cluster. So it is picked up automatically, no human interaction necessary. A single bootstrap node configuration is about 300 kilobytes. Um, so it's a lot of data conveyed in, in that ignition configuration. Uh, with OS versioning and security, we include OKD. We, we include Fedora Core OS in, a, in each OKD release. So we have a very clear pointer to the version of Fedora Core OS that is encapsulated within the machine, con machine OS container. And we know exactly what we're delivering every time. Yeah, it's cloud native and container focused, obviously. This is a Kubernetes distribution. And Fedora Core OS is aimed towards uh, running containerized workloads. 
and we automate that with the machine API and ignition. Automatic updates, we leverage the OpenShift update mechanism for it. And um, all you really need to do to update your OKD cluster is click a button once it's available. Next slide, please. A quick re recap, um, what is Fedora Core OS? It's an automatically updating Linux OS. It's aimed at containerized workloads based on RPM OS 3 and Ignition. It's composed of Fedora RPM packages, and it's great for running Kubernetes clusters on top, or OKD clusters. Next slide, please. If you want to join the Fedora CoreOS working group, you can find um, us in either of, of these places. Um, on IRC, it's um, the Fedora CoreOS uh, channel on Freenode. Uh, we have an issue tracker on GitHub. We have a discussion forum on the Fedora project uh, forum. We have a mailing, li uh, mailing list, um, and we also have weekly meetings on IRC which you can find on the ROS calendar. Next slide, please. So, and this is why we're here today. Uh, if you want to join the OKD working group and um, help and participate uh, in releasing and um, improving OpenShift and OKD4, uh, then please, uh, talk to us on Slack. We're on the OpenShift dev, the dev channel on the Kubernetes Slack. We're on the OpenShift Commons Slack. If you're a member there, um, you can find us on any of the channels, uh, really, uh, definitely on the general channel. Uh, we have our own Google group, which we reuse as a mailing list. Um, so it's the OKD minus uh, WG. Uh, Google group. We have bi-weekly video conference meetings, uh, which you can find on the OKD Fedora calendar, linked here. And we have two uh, repositories on GitHub where most of what we do um, is happening and documented. And those are the community and the OKD repositories in the OpenShift organization on GitHub. Next slide, please. Um, more links. Um, have a look at OKD.io. This is our main homepage. Uh, you can find everything uh, somewhere in there. Uh, the documentation is at docs.okd.io. And then um, the OKD repository again, which we use as a technical or a, a, an, is, an issue tracker for, for technical things and the community repo um, repository, which uh, we use as a tracker um, for meetings and group tasks and related things. And with that, I think if we have time for questions uh, after this, um, I'll be in the chat. We'll all, be, and, we'll all be in the chat with you uh, and we'll try and answer your questions. And um, please do come to um, the OKD working group meetings, um, especially if you're interested in deploying on any interesting configurations. We're always listening um, and looking for feedback um, and um, happy to help um, you answer any questions too. So um, look for us all, Antonio, Christian, and myself, and others um, from the working group in the in the Slack channels here and at um, other DevConf um, sessions. So um, thanks, uh, Christian and Antonio, for taking the time today to record this. And hopefully um, we gave you enough depth to get you um, started and interested in participating in this um, collaboration between the OKD and the Fedora core OS communities and um, keeping keep the open source uh, pursuit of happiness alive. So take care and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Uh
thanks a lot everyone for attending this session and yeah this was quite interesting session learning about the open shift and the kubernetes platform uh, i once again thanks to christian antonio and dine for sharing out their time and presenting out this session over to all of the open source community across the world and yeah we are open now for any of the questions or the q and a sessions you can just post uh, your questions in the chat box right now here we go i just pop in again and yeah i think we had a great session and i don't see any of the questions popping out in the chat box i think everyone is clear about the session uh, like they have just got every answer from this presentation slides so yeah thanks everyone for attending this session